Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures in the world of football talk to us about the first match they ever attended or indeed played in. Uh, I'm your host, Richard Foss, and I'm absolutely thrilled, thrilled to introduce today's guest, Stuart Robson. Stuart, I'm sure lots of you will know, is an ex-professional player, started his career at Arsenal, for whom he played over 150 games before moving to West Ham, and then finally on to Coventry, where he became the club captain. He currently works as a pundit mainly for broadcasters such as TNT, TalkSport, and also for US television, uh, ESPN and the like, alongside fellow podcast guest John Champion. Uh, indeed, I was introduced to Stuart by John at the recent championship playoff final at Wembley. Now, by weird coincidence, Stuart and I had met before on a, a muddy football field back in 1978, when we uh, were actually our schools played against each other. The only difference was Stuart was a sprightly 14-year-old and I was a wizened old 18-year-old. And, and shortly after that match, I think probably because of that match, because he dominated proceedings, he joined Arsenal and, this, as they say, the rest is history. But what we're going to do is we're going to start off with how you made your debut, Stuart, for Arsenal away at West Ham at Upton Park on the 5th of December 1981. And there are some nice little backstories I'd like you to uh, expand upon, which we spoke about when we met at Wembley. So over to you. Yes, I mean, first of all, I was disappointed that I hadn't got in the team a little bit earlier. I was only 17 and a, and a, and a month uh, old. I'd been away at the Junior World Cup, the Under-20 World Cup in Australia. I was the youngest player in the tournament at 16 at the time. And I was sort of the number one centre-half in the reserves, uh, ahead of, I would say, Chris Wyatt and uh, one or two other players that they had on the books at the time. And while I was away in Australia, um, the they sold Willie Young. Arsenal sold Willie Young to Nottingham Forest and Chris Wyatt got his chance and right. played very well in those first few games. So when I came back, uh, I was a little bit frustrated. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I played in the reserves at right back, which I'd never done before. So I realised that the club were trying something out. I knew they had a problem at right back. John Hollins was getting old. I think he was 38 mm -hmm. at the time. John Devine had fallen out of favour a little bit with the manager. Um, and having played against Bristol Rovers in the reserves on the, the previous Saturday, um, I was then called into the first team squad for the next game, which was against West Ham. But the big question was, I didn't actually train with the first team on the Friday. You know, because in those days, you had a, a, a 12 that, uh, that were going to play in the first team, a 12 that were going to play in the reserves, and a 12 that were going to play in the youth team. And I actually trained with the youth team on the Friday. And it was only when Fred Street, the physio, came uh, to, to find me and said, uh, you better look at the, the uh, a fixture board or the, the team board uh, and have a look and see where you are tomorrow. And there I looked. And I was in the first team, uh, and there was only twelve on the in the squad. So I knew I had a very good chance of playing, or certainly uh, I would be a substitute. So yeah. that was that was the start of it. Uh, but then there was a there was a great build up to the game as well. Yeah. So you, I remember you telling me that you were travelling to the match. Uh, I think it was on the day of the match, and you were. I think you were on the train and then suddenly you were noticing someone's face on the back pages. Well, it was quite funny because everybody seemed to know that I was starting the game apart from myself. Uh, <laughs> I found out that my uh, that Terry Neal, who was a, a, a great manager for me, Terry Neal had phoned up my parents the night before and said, uh, Stuart's going to play tomorrow, so make sure you go to the game. I've got tickets for you. Um, we haven't told him that. We 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 don't want to get him too nervous. You know, he's obviously still a young a young boy at seventeen and a, a month old, uh, and it's a massive game. West Ham, I think, were they'd only lost one game up to that point in the season. I looked it up a little bit earlier. They were almost yeah. top of the table. Uh, Arsenal were in fourth place, I think, at the time. Uh, so it's a massive game. So again, it would never happen in the, these days. So I lived at Canby Island at the time. First of all, I had to get a bus from where I lived to the train station at Benfleet. I then right. had to get a, a, a train from Benfleet to uh, Fenchurch Street, to get an underground from Fenchurch Street to, to eventually Arsenal, where I was yeah. picked up by Brian McDermott, who was, gonna, who was oh, in yeah. the squad. 
uh, the former Reading manager. He was in the, mm -hmm. a, a youngish player, probably 20 years old at the time, 21 years old at the time. He was going to pick me up and take me to the the um, where we had our pre-match meal, which was at the golf club at Totteridge. Mm -hmm. But on the way to the game, uh, I'm sitting on the train from Benfleet to, to Fenchurch Street. And as I'm looking at everybody else's papers, I can see that my face is on the back of all the papers. Uh, with the headlines, one headline said, public school top makes uh, um, Cockney Derby, make, makes his debut in Cockney Derby. Which, right. Because, as you know, you went to a private school like I did. Yeah. They, there wasn't too many footballers that came from private school at the time. So it was a big no. thing. Uh, and mm. that was the issue that, that was all over the back pages. So they knew I was playing. My mum and dad knew I was playing. The only person that didn't know that I was playing was me. Well, maybe that was deliberate. I've, I've spoken to a few people about saying that, you know, you, you sort of keep that back because if you'd been told days before, you might have got a bit nervous. Do you think that was a deliberate ploy? Oh, it was definitely a deliberate ploy, a ploy by Terry Neal. That's, uh, I think, why he phoned my parents up and told told them exactly that. Uh, yeah. The funny thing was I hadn't played right back that many times. So I was a bit anxious uh, about playing at right back. And when they named the team and they did it at the Totteridge Hotel, uh, my yeah. job, along with John Hollins, was to curb their West Ham's top player, the informed player in England at the time, which was Alan Devonshire, who yes. was uh, running amok against most defences and most right backs, uh, away from home in a hostile atmosphere, which was West Ham at the time. So mm -hmm. it was a it was a big big game, and it was on the telly as well. It was on Match of the Day, which yes. in those days, only two games were on Match of the Day, and that was one of them. Uh, and you knew that by the fact there was no advertising on your shirt. So as soon as you turned up and you saw there was no advertising on your shirt, you were going to uh, be on television. Okay, right, because it's BBC and obviously that's not allowed. It wasn't allowed. I don't think it was allowed on ITV, BBC. There was no advertising allowed on football yeah. shirt uh, on, okay. when it was on TV. And you also knew that you were going to be on TV because the kit man painted the stripes in your, on your boots for the for the advertisers, I suppose. I, probably he was paid okay. a little bit of money to to paint the boots so that uh, everybody could see you're wearing Adidas, which I was wearing, or Puma or, or Diodora, whatever the players was, whoever the players were sponsored by. So uh, that's the other reason you uh, knew you were on the telly. So it brings a whole new meaning to the word boot money, doesn't it, really? But, it does, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Something yes. slightly different, but, but we don't need to go into that. I'm sure you're never involved in any, any nefarious activities. Stuart. So, yeah, you're, so there you are, you're 17 say you you've just been thrust in to the first team at an unusual position i mean that must be terrifying you know because in i still play football and you know i i when i was younger i used to play a central midfield because i could run around a bit now i'm very much center back telling people what to do and i think i've probably played thousands of games at school at uni and then since and I doubt whether I've ever played it right back. I might have filled in at right back once. And I just remember it being so difficult because your whole vision changes. Because at centre back, it's all in front of you, it's nice. But at right back, you've got this angle. And did, was that something that you were really conscious of that you needed to almost change your vision and your yeah. approach to the game? Uh, to a certain degree, yes. I mean, uh... I had a good idea about what a right back should be doing and that you have to come mm. around your centre halves and all that. But I'd always played at either centre half or sweeper. I'd been away with the England squad, as I said, for the under 20 World Cup. And I'd been the centre half with a sweeper behind me. Quite often at, at, for the England youth side at a younger age groups, but at my own age groups, I played as the sweeper. Because right. uh, that was a fashionable uh, position at the time. Franz Beckendorf awesome. was making it, you know, the, the mm -hmm. position in any team. And England youth played me there. And I played there for Arsenal in the youth sides uh, coming up. Uh, but I could play centre-half. And the other place I often played was central midfield. So it was always on the centre of the pitch. Now yeah. to play uh, right back. Uh, and I remember getting the night before, because the, I had an inkling that I, that would be the position I would play if I played, uh, yeah. having seen the, the, the squad. Uh, I remember getting a book out. It was called The Book of Football to read what a right back should do. I mean, <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it, really? If, if you yeah. look back. Uh, this book of football, and it had a um, sort of basic things what a right back should do. I'm not sure it helped okay. me in the game, but uh, I read it the <laughs> night before. 
Uh, yeah, and as you say, you were up against Alan Devonshire, who was, you know, I remember him as a great player, and as you say, he was in a rich vein of form. But you mentioned there John Hollins, who was, as you say, was towards the end of his career, late 30s, but a lot of experience. So was was he sort of guiding you through it and talking you through it? Like, you know, you hope seasoned professionals will hope help the younger guys when they come into the team. Yes, he was absolutely perfect for me. He was 38, I think. I was 17, mm. so that's a big age difference. And yeah, his job was to sit in front of Devonshire to stop. So when the ball was on the far side of the field, we'd done a little bit of work in, in the team meeting about how we were going to try and stop him. And John mm. Holland was going to try and get in a, on, a, on a line with the ball and, and Alan Devonshire so that they had to chip it over him to get to Devonshire. And then by that time, I could get tight and get tackles in or whatever. Uh, and we organised each other. And John Hollins was very good. He went on the television after. They wanted me on the TV. Um, I think right. John Watson was the commentator and Jimmy Hill was, was the yeah. presenter. They wanted yeah. me to go on the TV. But Terry Neal said, right. no, he's too young. We'll, we'll, we'll put John Hollins on. And John Hollins spoke about how we talked to each other, how I was pushing him one way and pushing me the other. They were his words, not mine. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and we did a good job at Alan Devonshire. We won the game 2-1. He didn't yeah. play particularly well. I was able to get a lot of tackles in on him. Um, much the uh, um, uh, the anger of the uh, chicken run uh, down the yes. down the, down Upton Park, which was quite a hostile environment at the time. So it was a it was a it was a great day really. And I always look at people that have debuts where they where they come on as a sub in the Carabao Cup with, in front yeah. of three thousand. This was the biggest game of the day. It was, I think, 36,000 inside the stadium, which wasn't really made for 36,000. No. Uh, it was a, a, a first versus third, fourth yeah. uh, game. Uh, the atmosphere was incredible. When I always, when people ask me about the game, mm -hmm. we, didn't have, we didn't have warm ups, a team warm ups. You went out and warmed up yourself. And right. I spoke being slightly anxious and, and uh, I wanted to be out there quite early. So myself and Alan Sundland uh, mm -hmm. were the first players to go out onto the pitch to, to have a little kick about and have a little runner. The ground was full. It was at half, it was at probably at 20 past two. The ground was absolutely full, uh, mm -hmm. which you don't see these days. People come into the game quite late. No, no. And unfortunately, uh, if you may remember, Alan Sundland had had a car crash which killed two people. I didn't know um, and uh, he was in a bit of trouble for a while. Uh, yeah. And as we ran out, there was 36,000 people singing or yeah. chanting murder up, murder. And it was ringing around the ground. And I, I, I'll always remember that in my head, how he coped with that and just carried on. We'd, he didn't even mention it. We just carried on kicking the ball around. But it was a it was a very hostile atmosphere that day. So there was it was a it was just it was a fantastic day all round, really, in terms of the result, the, the way I played it being on TV. You know, yeah. it's, it's a game that I can always remember. Yeah. Well, it, you mentioned the chicken run there. And, and for younger listeners and viewers, they might not actually remember this. But the chicken run, I mean, if you think about the London Stadium where West Ham play now, it's as far away from a chicken run as possible. You couldn't even see a chicken because it's so far away, the pitch. But explain to us a little bit about the chicken run because it was along the side, wasn't it? And it was where some of the more vocal supporters, let's call it, were there. Yeah. So it was on the opposite side to the tunnel or the or where the changing rooms were. Uh, it was a, a two-tiered stand. The, the top tier was seating, but the bottom tier, which probably was only about 10 or 12 rows back, was standing. And if you were a hardcore West Ham fan, that's where you wanted to go and stand because that's where you could probably give the opposition players as much stick as possible. Uh, you right. could, Unfortunately, in those days, you could throw things on as well, which... Happened yes. in that game. The game was stopped because of things that were thrown really? on. Them. Not at me, fortunately, um, right. but uh, one or two of our other players. Uh, and yeah, it was it, the chicken run was one of the most hostile. Uh, I think the equivalent would be the shelf at Tottenham. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, but it was it was a, a very very hostile environment, uh, and they were very vociferous. But they were also fair. You know, if you played right. well, they'd they'd give you encouragement and they'd clap you off if if you played well or if you got a strong tackle in. They, they were a good crowd. Yeah, and then clearly you ended up playing for West Ham. So I, I do think it's, we're going to touch on this a little bit during this podcast, that you do have a lot of coincidences in your career. So 
your first ever match as a pro was Arsenal at West Ham. You then moved to West Ham. And then we're going to talk about a couple of your other debuts and landmark yeah. games. And actually, it connects the clubs together. So so I think that's always quite nice. I did... Um, I will try and put up the link to the match of the day highlights. So they say the, the, the short highlights on YouTube because John Motson, you're quite right, is the commentator. And he does the normal thing. So this is the West Ham team. I think he says uh, they were a second division side when they last met Arsenal because they beat them in the FA Cup final uh, a year or two before. And then you you trot out. And there he goes. He goes, oh, and there's ex-public school boy, yeah. Stuart Robson. And, he, you know, you, you, there you are, the public school toff. You're that. Yeah. Um, nice welcome, I'd imagine. It, yes, it was a nice welcome. and It, it wasn't quite uh, good on the Sunday papers where people used to write in like, uh, in Sunday papers. I got very good, you know, reviews from the game. But uh, apart from some West Ham supporters that phoned in, uh, that wrote in and said... Uh, Considering he's a public school boy, he played like an animal and he was dirty, you know, and if that's good play, oh, really? I, you know, is that what they teach him at public school? Things like that. So, <laughs> right, uh, okay. It, it was quite an interesting, uh, it was quite an interesting response to uh, being a public school boy. But it carried on for quite a while, as you can imagine. Uh, yeah. It gave me a little bit of stick uh, at mm-hmm. some grounds when you played. Yeah. Um, yeah, I won't say exactly what they they would shout out, but it, it wasn't no. very pleasant, and it was a it was their sort of understanding of what happened at public schools. But um, yes, uh, which you and I would know is not quite the the case. Absolutely, absolutely not. I mean, you say it is quite rare for any public school boy to make it to the pro game. I will quote: "There's one as a Palace fan." Will Hughes went yes. to Repton. Repton. And in fact, I when I was at Bradfield School, I went to we used to play Repton because there was mm. up near Derby. I don't know whether Brentwood, your you No, we didn't played. we didn't play Repton. You were in the Southern players with. from the public schools. I played for the public schools eleven or yeah. they, and uh one or two Repton players were playing. I think there are more and more public school boys playing uh, pro football now because because their dads, the the, the ex footballers, send their yes. kids children to public schools. Frank yeah. Lampard, to Brentwood, because his mm. his dad could afford to send him there, and and that's happening more and more now. So you'll see more public school boys uh, play yeah. professional football, but they don't mention it anymore. No, it's it's not such a thing, I suppose. Because at Bradfield, long enough, long since I left, uh, Neil Webb's son took mm-hmm. over as the head of football mm-hmm. and you know he did I mean he's left in the last year or yeah. so but they have got a stream of players coming through who could be good enough to play at that level and interesting you should mention um Frank Lampard because Frank Lampard senior was playing in, in this game. game yes he was he was playing at left back uh and his usual role was to feed um Alan Devonshire and yeah. John Holland's job was to try and block that off, so he had to go in midfield, into midfield before it came back out to Alan Devonshire. Uh, so it was just that we we had a good game plan. Don Howe was very good at those sort of little um, uh, tactical adjustments, mm-hmm. uh, and he gave us the idea. I mean, again, if I was the coach now or, or, or when I was coaching, you'd spend two or three days working with the players to to come up with yeah. this tactic. We talked about it for ten minutes before the game. You know that that, that yeah. was the that was the tactical that was the tactical nous that uh, we, we were given. Uh, and you know, I we didn't I didn't know anything about how we were we going to try and play offside. Were we not going to play offside? Was Dave O'Leary yeah. the right side of centre half going to step up? <laughs> what what yeah. was our what was our defensive line going? We never talked about anything like that. And there I was, seventeen, thrust into this game, um, a game that I thought I should have played a month earlier, mind you, as I, yes. as I said. Before. Um, so yeah, it, it, it could have all gone horribly wrong. You know, that's, that's mm. the, when, when you look back at these things, if I'd have played terribly and Alan Devonshire had gone past me four or five times and, and created through three or four goals, that could yeah. have been the end of your career in one, in one game. But fortunately it all went well. And, uh, I was never really out the Arsenal team from then on. No, which it's very impressive. You, as you say, 17. You're quite wet behind the ears there, aren't you? And you go into, you know, this was the first division as it was, top, you know, top teams. And as you say, West Ham were absolutely flying that time. So it's not 
a gentle baptism. You are thrown in. You've got the chicken rung suggesting that, you know, your public school background has not not worked and you're, you're being a little bit too rough. But um, I remember also when we, we had that brief chat at Wembley for the, the Championship playoff final recently, you said that one of their players, a chap called David Cross, mm. um, originally was quite welcoming and then it turned a little bit. So tell us something about that. Well, I think all the news, all the papers you know, on that morning were talking about me. So the, the West Ham players all knew probably that I was only 17 and you know, I was a young yeah. player, been playing for the England youth team and got a lot of potential. And uh, Paul Allen was in their team as well. And Paul Allen had been on the Under-20 World Cup with me. He was our captain. So uh, he okay. did well. So as we came out of the tunnel, he sort of said, good luck. And as the game started, David Cross ran... Right, probably 30 yards to me. He was the centre forward and, and he was a, an aggressive centre forward, I think it's fair to say, but a good one. He scored a lot of goals yeah. for West. He came running over to me at right back. I thought, what's he going to say? And he shook my hand. He said, good luck, son. The ball then went out of play and I was taking a little bit of time to pick it up because just to let the game settle, let myself settle down. And he picked it up, shoved it in my chest. He said, get on with it. You know, and yes. He said it with a, in, a, in slightly more um, constructive words, I would say. Or, or, or yeah. Run. Possibly, possibly more forcefully. More forcefully, yes. I think that's fair to say, yes. So, but yeah, it was, so there was there was a there's you saw professionalism it, it, it straight away. But he was he was nice enough to come over and wish me all the best. And you know, it's a big game for you, and hope it all goes well. Uh, and then now the game started. You know, you, you're the you're the enemy, or you're the, the, you're, the, you're, the you're the foe. And yeah, you get on with it. All the niceties get put to one side. And we're, we're man on man. I think yeah, they call yeah. it. Because um, actually, you mentioned Paul Allen. Because in that commentary, John Motson, he says the fact that you're 17 and Paul Allen was also a very young player and had, had broken the record as the youngest player in the FA Cup final. Remember, which yes, okay. you know, was a year or two before that. Two years beforehand, yeah, he was the youngest yeah. player in that, in, against Arsenal. Um, and yeah. he'd, uh, at, that, at that particular point, I don't think he'd developed quite as much as they thought he might do when we went to the England, uh, with England to the, that uh, World Cup in Australia, mm. under the World Cup, where he was the captain. Uh, I don't think he was, the, he, he was the standout player there. You know, he was the most yeah. experienced player, along with uh, a player called Trevor, uh, uh, Andy Peake. Who played? Oh, I remember Charlton. Was he Charlton? He played Leicester. At Charlton eventually, but he started at Leicester. Yeah. He got to Leicester's That's team. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I was looking at those players to be the inspiration because they're the players that played first team football, played in the in the top flight, um, and they were a couple of years, three years older than me. Um, mm. So yeah, it was a, it was a, that that was a very good experience for me because that was the first time I played in front of big crowds. Uh, yeah. in that Australia World Cup. So we played against Argentina in front of 30,000. We played against oh, wow. Australia in, 30, in front of 30,000. Unfortunately, yeah. we went out to Qatar in the semi-final of, of the tournament. Uh, and it was only, uh, only later on that when John Cartwright, our coach, went out to Kuwait and mm. uh, started coaching out there, he realised that some of those Qatar players weren't under 20. Most of them were 24, oh. 25. So yes. uh, that, that might be one of the reasons we lost them in the semi-final. We should always check the birth certificates when you start these games, surely. Uh, well, I think they'd all been doctored at the time. Yes, I think. Uh, of course. At that particular time, there wasn't quite so. It wasn't the regulations weren't quite so strict. No, I, I understand that. So it, it, it's interesting because Qatar obviously then uh, was the host of the World Cup, and I assume. Did you go to commentate out in Qatar? I did. No, I did it. I did lots of things from home, but um, for the feed, yeah, as ESPN. Uh, I'd lost the rights who I who I work right. for a couple of World Cups. Yes. Uh, I think now it's Fox who have the rights in a, in America, um, but we could still do shows around it. So I did shows around. Yeah. It. Okay. Um, but as you say, a great experience play in front of big crowds and against Argentina, the likes of Argentina, or Australia in their home touch. So. Um, and I, I, I'll just carry on. The, the I was playing yeah. centre half. The centre forward for Argentina was Burachaga, who then went on oh, to yeah. score the uh, winning goal. I think it was in the World Cup, nineteen eighty six World Cup, eighty six. Yeah, yeah. Burachaga scored uh, against uh, in, in Mexico. Um, and unfortunately for Argentina, they didn't get through the group stages. It was Cameroon, England, uh, Argentina, and Australia. Australia being right. the host. 
nation and England and Australia went through. We went through as the leading uh, leading team and Argentina were third, having lost to Australia. So even though they had the goalkeeper, Glenn Cachea, I think his name was, and Burachaga, the centre forward, both yeah. those players went on to be World Cup winners in 1986. OK, and we will touch on, in fact, let's go through it now because you, uh, once you started at Arsenal, you were, uh, I think you were called up to the senior squad, weren't you? Uh, just before the World Cup, but then you got injured. Is that correct? Well, I, I uh, during that season, I'd had a really good season in 1985, mm. 86. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'd won player of the, well, it wasn't Premier League then, it was called the First Division uh, Player right. of the Month on two occasions. Okay. Right. And both times, uh, the person that comes to give you the award was Bobby Robson. And I've been nice. in the under twenty ones. I've been captain of the under twenty ones on several occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, and he he planned out. He said, "You're going to go to the World Cup. We're going to play you against uh, Egypt away from home. We're going to then play you against Scotland, and you're going to be in the World Cup squad okay. uh, if those games go well." Unfortunately, yeah. I got an injury. Couldn't play against Egypt. Uh, right. Then was out for a while. And then, rather than play against Scotland, he contacted me to say. I want you to play in the more important game, which was the under twenty ones against Italy for the qualifier uh, to see who qualified for the European Championships. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, and it was played at Swindon on a mud heap, and it went uh, well. I scored the goal, um, and Viali scored the equaliser. It meant they went through, and we oh, wow. did. Um, the next night. Uh, England played Scotland and Steve Hodge who had been an overage player in the under 21s with me played in that game and played very well uh, yeah. and as a result kept his place and, and uh, the, the press was sort of pushing for him to to to, to be in the, in the squad mm -hmm. so and I didn't play for probably about 10 games until the last two or three games of the season so Bobby Robbins said I'm, I'm going to put you in the the 26. Um, mm -hmm. but probably you won't be in the 22. Right. Uh, so while I was slightly disappointed, I was almost a little bit relieved because I wasn't fully fit. And I, yeah. you, you don't want to go in a tournament and, and not be fully fit and, and make your dinger debut and not be fully fit. Yeah. Um, then uh, I was called up um, and I played in a couple. I thought I'd better play in a couple of testimonials because I'm on standby. So I played in as many testimonials as I could, one being for West Ham against Tottenham. For, I'm not quite sure how that came about, but I played for West Ham yeah. against Um And I suddenly got the phone call because Brian Robson had dislocated his shoulder in, against uh, in one of the pre-tournament games. Yeah. And they had to make a decision uh, on the, say, the Tuesday, Tuesday mm -hmm. at five o'clock what the squad was going to be. I had my bags packed, um, ready to go to Heathrow, um, and then I got the call to say, no, Brian Robson said he's okay. Um, the physio and the, and the doctor said he's going to be okay. Of course, he wasn't okay because in the very first yeah. game, he dislocated his shoulder again. So, but yes. I was actually relieved I didn't go because I probably wouldn't have been fully fit and it's not the time to make your debut or play in a tournament, which was proved later on uh, because the very first game of next, year, next season, I got into the England squad again and went to Sweden and I was desperate not to play because the injury that I had beforehand, the groin injury, the pelvic injury, hadn't hadn't mm -hmm. gone away. And, yeah. uh, and that's where, when uh, I I fell out with George Graham at the start of his um, tenure at Arsenal. Yeah. I think a lot of people fell out with George Graham, but we're, we're not going to go yeah. there, are we? No. <laughs> um, so that is... The fact is that you could have been one of those players who'd been left in Maradona's trail in the Azteca in 1986. You could have been one of those one going, oh, where's he going now? It's Terry Butcher, yeah. it's Terry Fennick. Oh, it's Stuart Robson just trying well, to catch it. The, the player that I would have probably been in place of would have been Peter Reid. Oh, oh, that's true. And he was one of the ones he who went one past. That he went past first. Uh, yeah. The midfield then was, was Peter Reid and uh, Glenn Hoddle, which wasn't yeah. the best. Uh, defensive, uh, I think Hodge played on the left hand side, and I right. think probably Trevor Stephen played on the right hand side. I'm I'm not That's right. sure, but that was probably the midfield that played against Argentina that day. Yeah, um, if only, if only, Stuart, you, okay. could, you could have been there. Um, 
what I usually do is I usually flip back to the first match and I'm going to do that again because, you know, we talked about a couple of the, the West Ham players. So, as you say, Alan Devonshire, Frank Lampard, we talked about David Cross, Paul Allen. Uh, Trevor Brooking was still there and he was still playing. He was about 33, I think I could work out. So yeah. He was towards the end of his career. Clearly, he had scored the goal that, West Ham beat F, uh, Arsenal in that FA Cup final. I, I'm trying to think, you may know this, I can't think of many headers that Trevor Brooking scored, but that was one of them, and it was about three yards out, and he just stooped and headed there. So one of my questions is, when teams have come across each other, and I know you'd only just arrived uh, at the Arsenal team, this is your debut, but is there some... You know, do, do players say, oh, yeah, well, we beat you at Wembley, we're going to beat you again? Was only that sort of the, the recent history, do players use that to maybe even wind up the opposition, say, oh, we've got your number, don't worry about it, that sort of thing? I don't think players would, would um, make those comments to the opposition. They might think it in their own mind, you know, you know I, I like playing against this player or I like playing against this yeah. team. You know, I've, I always get the better of him. Um, um and I think going into that game, West Ham were favourites to win the game. Um, Arsenal, Arsenal that season were we'd been oh, Arsenal had been in three cup finals. Uh, they'd been mm. to the the um, European Cup Winners' Cup final, um, yeah. which they lost to Valencia on penalties. Uh, so Arsenal were, were 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 just on it coming down because they were seen by the fans as a selling club because they'd got rid of well they'd sold Liam Brady to Juventus and they'd sold Frank yeah. Stapleton. Uh, to Manchester oh, yes. United. So there was a lot of anger around the ground, the, the club at the time is where are Arsenal yeah. going here? You know, they've, mm. they're, they're, they're almost there, but they've just sold two of their best players. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, and they didn't seem to be spending big on new players coming in on that particular season, because in right. the game you're talking about, the my debut, we only had one forward, which was Alan Sunderland, uh, mm -hmm. who wasn't really, you would say, an out and out uh, a target man. And Graham Ricks played up alongside him because they bought two players on free transfers, John Hawley and Ray Hankin uh, from right. Leeds, and uh, I think both from Leeds, who yes. evident very early on in the, the season weren't going to be good enough to play in the first team. And neither of them were sub, in, or, sub or anywhere near the team. They were, they were uh, in the reserves that day. They then yeah. came into the team the next game because we had injury problems when we played Liverpool away in the, in the League Cup. But mm -hmm. So there was a lot of... Arsenal weren't the fashionable club at that particular time and West Ham were they, they'd won the cup yeah. two years before and they got promoted from the second division they were top of the, top or second in the table in this mm. particular game they had some very good players Ray Stewart was the penalty king of course they'd spent a lot of money on Phil Parks being I think he was yeah. the most expensive goalkeeper at the time Alvin Martin was at the the, the uh, start mm -hmm. of his career and Billy Bonds was even then was a, a club legend and he was the captain. Yeah, yeah. So they had a, a, a particularly good team. The area where they were probably just lacking was central midfield, where they had, um, where I think it was Pike. Pike didn't play that day, but Paul Allen and Pike were usually the midfield and Trevor Brooking played That's in right. front. Yeah. Uh, but Brooking was obviously a player that drifted all around the pitch. Um, mm. And they had a, a player called Bobby Barnes, who had also played against or played with for England youth, who had an absolute shocker against Kenny Sampson. And was taken off right. at half time for Dale Banton, who came on. Okay, yes, Bobby Barnes, who then came part of the PFA, didn't he? Yeah. And I think yeah. might still be. Uh, I think he's still a big, uh, big part of the PFA. He was almost head of the PFA for for a little while. Indeed, um, yeah. And you mentioned, <laughs> excuse me, the Arsenal team. So Kenny Sanson, as a Palace fan, I I still haven't seen a better left back. Uh, you know, and when I first started watching them, it was a little bit earlier. But when he came into the team, he just looked so accomplished and obviously went on to a great career with Arsenal and England. And could you tell, you know, when you train with these guys and you eventually end up playing with them, can you tell immediately this guy's got it? Well, Kenny Sanson came to Arsenal the season before. And I, yes. I because I as you know, our school holidays when you went to a public school were slightly different. And mm -hmm. whenever I had an extra week off, they always got me to come in and I would quite often train with the, with the first team um, as, a, as a young 15-year-old if, if, yeah. uh, if, if they were around. And they just bought Kenny Sampson. And I never, ever 
while he was at Arsenal until a little bit later on, never saw anybody go past him. Uh, he was the best 1v1 defender uh, there was in, in, in world football, I would say, at the time. Uh, yeah. between, these eight, between the ages of 19 and 23, I'd say, when he was at his fittest, he was at his sharpest, mm -hmm. he was at his hungriest. Uh, he was an outstanding player. There's no doubt about it. He was a brilliant left back, uh, at, uh, both with and without the ball. And I played with him again uh, many years later when he came to Coventry yes. at the same time as me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. He wasn't quite in the same shape or quite uh, as fit as he was when he was uh, uh, 19 to 22. I have to, it has to be said. Yeah, but, uh, he was an outstanding yeah. player. Yeah, Kenny Sanderson. Absolutely. Um, and and you do mention John Hollins, uh, and actually he died. Exactly a year ago today, unfortunately. Um, and he was experienced and a great player. I mean, he generally he was a midfield player, wasn't he? So it's sort of covering, as you say, for that. And also you mentioned Chris White as someone who came into the side when you were uh, out in Australia. Funny enough, he scored the first goal. He did. Um, uh, it came from. It was. A, I think I remember rightly. It was a corner that was mm. half cleared, and he 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 was a skillful uh, centre back, uh, and he threatened to shoot, took it onto one foot, and smashed it into the corner, and that put us one nil up. But he was yeah. a centre half that uh, was prone to mistakes, particularly at uh, when he was playing in the reserves. And I don't think they ever really fancied him uh, as being a top class player or being a, a first team player, uh, yeah. and. He played in the first team quite well for two or three two two or three years before they bought Tommy Caton. And Tommy Caton then mm. came into the side. And Chris White drifted into the reserves. And at time, they were trying to play him at centre forward at one point. John Cartwright, who'd come into the club, wanted a big centre forward. And he said, I'm sure Chris right. White's got the skill. You know, can he be a target man? He's not going to be the best centre half ever, which he, which was proved wrong because he went to Leeds and won a, a, a title with Leeds. Of course um, he did, yeah, yeah. Chris White. And he, but he partnered David O'Leary, who was the big player at the time. David O'Leary was the one, probably the highest paid player at Arsenal at, uh, at that point. Um, because, because they'd lost Liam Brady, because they'd lost Frank Stapleton, David O'Leary's in a great position. The crowd said, you can't sell him as well. So he got a massive yeah. contract. Uh, right. And you are forgetting one, or I'm forgetting one person, who was uh, a, 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 an absolute legend. Uh, and Pat Jennings was in goal. In this game, of course, yes, yes, he you was. Know, who, yeah. had, who, who was probably he must have been 38, 39 at the time. So, uh, there were two very experienced players, and Pat Jennings was and had been a, a great goalkeeper and, a, and a, a top class character, you know. So, it was a joy to play with, with him for two or three seasons, yeah. And it, it, I mean, you're talking about legends of the game, I know legends is probably an overused word, but I mean, come on, Pat Jennings. Kenny Sanson, John Hollins, you've also got on the you know West Ham side track. I mean, that is a pretty impressive array of players to to make your debut amongst. So the fact that you did pretty well, uh, as you say, that's a tick, and that probably was the launch pad for your mm -hmm. career over the next fifteen mm -hmm. years. So you know, it's it's. Uh, I would have. I I I one of those people who knew deep down I was never going to be a pro player, but I played to a reasonable level. And there were just moments where you think, oh, if only it had fallen into place there. Mm. But actually, I was miles away and never would have gone anywhere near it. But we can all dream, Stuart. We can all dream. Um, so actually in the programme, because I think I mentioned to you, I, I've actually got hold of the programme. I don't know if you have a copy of this i haven't got a copy no uh, my my parents must have it somewhere because they went to the game and right. uh, it's in my loft somewhere because they every time they went to a game and they went to most of my games all around the country mm -hmm. they've got a program so i've got a big box of programs upstairs which have got which i haven't seen for many many years but i know they're up there um, okay. well sure. i was going to send you this anyway so you didn't have to go up to the loft i'll save you your knees so but it's it's really nice uh, because it's a tiny programme. Look at that. I mean, the state of it, it's really quite small. Um, and then you look inside and they talk about uh, in the sort of, it's quite nice because you get it from eBay and therefore you get the little thing which actually tells you what happened in the match. You say Chris White scored after 15. John Holland scored first, a penalty. First, right on the stroke of half time, 2-0 yeah. up. 
I'm sure the chicken run were enjoying that. And then, yep. um, funny enough, Stuart Pearson scored quite late on for West Ham. And whoever was the programme coordinator, Stuart Pearson was on the back. So that obviously worked quite well. I did, um, yeah. So looking at the intro, they talk about Far Eastern Promise. So this is the sort of chat in the programme. And it's all about the fact that the World Club Cup final had been in Tokyo. So, I mean, you've been in Australia. World Cup, And they were saying this is the way football's going. And, and you know, to a certain extent it did, and then to a certain extent it didn't. Um, and they were talking about the f- possibility of China qualifying for the 1982 World Cup finals as it was yeah. then, and talking about Kuwait. It just interests me because you think about a country like China, a massive country, but have never, never really made it in football terms. You could say the same about India. You Mm. know, these are the two biggest countries in terms of population. There is interest, clearly, in India, more to do with cricket than football. But, you know, there are 1.4 billion people. So they they would have enough. I just find it interesting. And have you ever thought about how... It's something that never has quite materialised and why that is, because with the vast population, interest in sport, and they can throw money at it, let's face it, why has it never actually come off? Uh, For India, you've you've mentioned it uh, quite clearly there, they're mad on their cricket. And I don't think they were... I I commentated on the Indian Football League, which was uh, Mm -hmm. started four or five years ago. Uh, And unfortunately, all they got was... Aging players who are way past their best, uh, and alongside some Indian players that weren't good enough. So yeah. I think the focus is so much on cricket that, um, mm. that that football will never really take off in, yeah. in India, but it should take off in China. I don't. Uh, yeah. There's no reason why it, it couldn't. There's no reason why. Uh, I mean, when I was at West Ham, we always mm. used to have two Chinese players come over every uh, okay. every summer pre-season training. Uh, I'm not sure what the link was. Um, and they were always very fit. They were always quite skillful, but they were never taken on. Um, there yeah. was, was something that that stopped John Lyle or Everson saying, "Oh, let's give them a chance." So they were sent back every time. It's, uh, so four or five, three or four years I was there, two players came over from China every t- every preseason and never quite were good enough. But at least they were given a chance, I suppose. Mm. Well, I, I've been at Palace. We had two Chinese players, Sanji Hai and Fan He. And they were good players. And you thought, OK, this is the beginning of, you know, lots of Chinese players coming and playing this. But again, it didn't really happen and it just drifted away. I, I, I'm not quite sure why it is. Maybe, you know, maybe Stuart, you and I should put together a, a, a programme, a documentary about why it isn't happening in China. I don't know how many people will watch it, but there we go. I did, um, I, I did commentated on Japan, uh, the J League, when it first started. Yeah. And that, that was a decent league. But again, they imported so many players from Brazil to start with. Yes, that, I remember that. You think, this actually isn't, you're not promoting the Japanese players particularly because they were, there was mm. too many Brazilian players playing in it. And, and, and again, probably players that weren't quite good enough to, to, to be in the Brazilian league and not quite good enough to go to Europe. So they were playing yes. in, the, in the J-League. And it was well supported that some of the crowds were excellent. Mm. Uh, but it never it never took off as much as I thought it would do because at one point they were getting really good crowds. They were getting uh, some good teams. Uh, but even if you look at the Asian Cup, the Japanese yeah. teams don't often win it. It's the South Korean teams that quite often do. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. And it's also interesting because, you know, Japan and South Korea hosted the World Cup. And you thought, oh, now this is it. This is going to be the moment where it leads. And and clearly we've had quite a few Japanese players. We've still got, you know, and we've got some South Korean players, Song Yi Ming being a perfect example. Um, but again, they're close, I think, in terms of becoming, you know, a force. And, you know, who knows, at a World Cup in four years, eight years' time, you might suddenly see an Asian country getting close, if not taking the whole thing over. But you, I've always felt, you know, I've written a book about the World Cup. You always feel that it's going to be very difficult to break the European-South American axis. Yeah, it will be. I mean, my take on it is that they'll probably spend a lot of money on, on 
facilities. They'll spend a lot of money on certain areas of the game in these countries. But unfortunately, the, the, the things they need most are the top class coaches. And not yeah. just, I'm not talking at the senior level. It's no good no. hiring, a, hiring a, a great manager to run the national team. You need great coaches going in there at junior level. That's where it needs to start. And that's where they will only get better if, if the top class coaches go there um, and, and coach on a regular basis rather than just going in there for two years and then coming back out and they see it as a, as a, as a way of making a, a quick quick money. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's not the way that the, the country is going to develop if that's the way, what they're looking to do. No, I think you're right. I think, you know, as you say, you can throw money, but you need the foundations. You need it coming through youth, the academies, the schools, and then, you know, you can hire the great managers. Players, cause players, got... are, made, players are made uh, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. That's when, that's when they, a lot of their technical ability comes from that age. Mm. You can't then suddenly do it at 18, 19, 20. It's, it's too late. No. Um, and did you... So when you were playing as an eight, nine-year-old, did you have that feeling, I, I'm going to do this for a career? As I say, lots of us do it, not many of us actually make it. But was that something that you had a deep, instilled confidence it was going to happen? It's, uh, not at that age. I mean, in terms of, I knew I was better than everybody else. Um, I was playing, uh, I went to, to uh, Allen Court School at 13. So I'm oh, sorry, went up to 13, it was a prep school. And at yeah. eight years old, um, I'm better than than anybody else at the school. So I'm in the in the first team at nine years old. Yeah. Uh, so I knew I was better than everybody, everybody else. Uh playing on a Sunday, uh, I play up age groups and mm -hmm. oh, again, I was better than everybody else. Yeah. But I never thought about being a professional footballer until um I'd been because I went to private school, I couldn't play for any districts or anything like that. And then I played in the representative team of the league that I was playing in, Sunday league I was playing in, the Thundermite League at the age of, of 12, 13. And it was the first representative game I played. And we went over to uh, South East Essex, which was meant to be the hub of, of all the players that went to West Ham and all that sort of stuff. And we won the game 6-0 and I was playing in central midfield and scored four. And at the end of the game, my parents came I got in the car and my friend said, oh, I've got some news for you. So I said, what's, what's, what's that? Um, somebody on the side of the pitch was an Arsenal um, youth team coach and he wants you to go. It was, bank, it was um, a half term. He said, can you go tomorrow to spend the week at Arsenal? So I went up there and I was a bit nervous. It was in the days, I can say this, we, my mum took me up on the train on the Monday and we were worried about going into London at the time because there was all the IRA bombings and things like that. And London was seen as a place where you don't really want to go there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We, we went up on the train and uh, I went in there and I was nervous because I didn't, didn't know how good these people were going to be. Mm -hmm. And on the third day, we then, the, the, Terry Burton, who was, the, who was in charge of it, said, we've got a game against West Ham at uh, their training ground, Chadwell Heath, uh, an under-13 game. You're yeah. all going to be involved. And he made me captain and sweeper for the game. And we won the game 3-1 and I scored two goals from sweeper. So I realised then wow. that uh, I might have a chance here. Um, and an even better chance, I realised, was when I got picked for the, go back to the public school, I got picked for the public schools 11 mm -hmm. um, to play the FA Youth 11. And I was only 15 and the rest right. of the FA Youth 11 was 17, 18. And um, John Carwright was the coach of England, and they'd always won the game comfortably. Uh, and we drew two all. I was a sweeper. Um, and um, everybody said I was the best player on the field. And the, the, Sun, the Telegraph wrote a big article on me after the game. Uh, and John Cartwright, on the back of that, picked me for the England youth squad uh, to go for training with them. So I realised uh, at quite a young age that yeah. I was more advanced than a lot of the players that were that, that were actually doing well higher up the the, the, the the scale. Yeah. So it's as you say, you had evidence quite early on that you were certainly in the frame. And I was and young, but it, it, in most of everything, I was the youngest player to do things. So I was the youngest player at that World Cup, the under twenty World Cup by uh, by quite a way. Uh I was the youngest player 
to play for the public schools team, you know, when uh, only 15, when it's, a, yeah. it's an under 18 tournament. Um, I, I was in the, the reserves, uh, still as a schoolboy at Arsenal. Uh, and I was, I think, the second youngest player at the time to play for Arsenal on that day. We're talking about against West Ham. Uh, okay. There's been others since then, but that was at the time, it was the second y- youngest player. Uh, and I was the youngest player to play for the England youth. So I suppose things came quite quickly for me, which gave me a realisation that I was going to be a footballer. Yeah, absolutely. And you proved it over many years. Um, to go back to the programme, you see, I, here we've got the Arsenal squad. Unfortunately, you didn't make the, the picture. You're probably, you're probably training with the youth team somewhere. But yeah, well, that, that's that would... the whole squad. Yeah, that would have been um, yeah, because I was I I would have just joined them as an apprentice uh, when exactly. that photo was taken. I'd have only yeah I'd only been sixteen, uh, so I'd have been in the youth team photo, I'd imagine. Yeah, well, you got you got your uh, driver there, Bra McDermott in the front, yeah. alongside John Devine and uh, Paul Davis as well. Um, and as even in this program. They got the lineups, and because it was such a late decision, you didn't make the line. Oh, no, so. no, that was the whole point. It was a, it was a very yeah. late decision. Uh, exactly. I, I made, they, maybe they they'd made the decision earlier, but didn't tell anybody because the fact that I played it right back in the previous game against Bristol Rovers in the reserves, mm. they must have made their mind up that I was going to play in this one. But you'd have thought yeah. I'd have trained with them all week and, uh, and yeah. played it right back in some of the practice matches. But no, that wasn't the no. case thrown in uh, fresh and ready. So, 